Hello again. Welcome to another edition of Media Watch. I'm your co-host, Eric Tate. I'm Bob Anthony. I'm Raymond Peterson. I'm Warren Bonilla. Our guest today is attorney Warren Bonilla. And Warren is joining us because, as we have done a few times in the past, when we have legal issues that we want to at least explore, we call on Warren. When he can't do it, he recommends someone else. But today he's with us. So, Warren, we are doing this in conjunction with EVT Educational Productions, uh, Manhattan Neighborhood Network, and the good graces of Zoom. <laughs> so we want to dig into um, something that I know we've talked to you about in the past, but recently the Westchester County DA made an announcement that their office was going to revisit two high profile cases that are actually were high profile 10 years ago and its cases are now 10 years old. Uh, and those two cases, Raymond and Bob can kind of give us some background information, but DJ Henry was one and Kenneth Chamberlain was the other. And I know we talked about both of those cases on Media Watch with and without Warren. Um, first, tell us quickly, Ray, what do we know about the DJ Henry case? Uh, and uh... well, what we know about it is uh, that he was shot and killed. Bye. Uh, how that happened was uh, he was a football player for you know uh, Pace University and Pleasantville campus. They had a homecoming game that weekend, which was kind of special for him because it was against his hometown college's team. They had the game, unfortunately lost, 27 zip. Um, he went to dinner that evening with his family and friends. And after dinner, he went back to the dorm in Pleasantville, uh, gathered with some friends. And about 10.30, they decided to go down to this bar, the name of which is uh, Finnegan's, I believe, I, I, I'm not seeing it right now, uh, where other team members and students were going to meet. Uh, at, at some point, there was an argument, an altercation in the bar that had nothing to do with DJ's party. Uh, the, bar, uh, the owner threw everybody out, closed it down. A little later, as the crowd was gathering in the parking lot nearby, bartender called the police and said, there's a fight going on outside. So the police responded to a fight in progress response. Upon arrival, first cop on arrival said, yeah, there's a bunch of people. There doesn't appear to be any fighting, et cetera, et cetera. Another gentleman, uh, another policeman arrived and uh, looked around. He said, he reported back that there's no fighting here but he saw a car parked in the fire lane, which he wanted to move, obviously. Uh, that was DJ's car. DJ had, the car was still sitting there because not everybody from his party had arrived out of the club. DJ went back to look for some people. He was looking for three guys. He only came back with one. So they sat there to wait for other people. The first cop on the scene who reported that there was no fighting, nothing going on, wanted to move the car. I'm sorry, that was the second policeman on the scene. He arrived, he wanted to move the car because it was in the fire lane. He tried to get their attention unsuccessfully. So he went over to the car, wrapped on it uh, rapidly, which I guess frightened the inhabitants. Uh, so DJ began to leave. This is where it gets nuts. DJ leaves, he's, drive he's still driving in the fire lane, which turns a corner, which is where they encountered Hess. Hess for whatever reason, and I can read you two different accounts, it's Hess's and the occupant's uh, statement, but the point is that Hess eventually ended up on top of the car shooting at DJ point blank. That's what happened. Okay. So he was moving his car out of the fire lane. Away gonna, from I, I imagine he was speeding maybe a little bit because he was frightened because, it's, you know, I've had, a, I've had cops knock on my car, you know, and say, move, and you move. So he was probably trying to get out of there as fast as he possibly could. 
and he turned, as I say, they had to turn a corner to exit, and uh, that's when they encountered Hess. Um, Hess said that he thought when the car pulled away, he thought that he saw the car hit the police officer who asked them to move. Um, okay, all right, a lot of confusion. In a lot of confusion. I can, I, I can read you a statement from one of the occupants in the car, if you would like. I, I, the bottom line is the kid was shot dead. The bottom, line is, the, the bottom line is that the kid was shot for no damn reason. Okay, Period. all right, all right. Uh, and and the, the other case, Bob, is Kenneth Chamberlain. And it, this is like 2010 and 2011, almost a year apart. Yeah. Uh, I think DJ was 2010 and Chamberlain was 2011. I think you're right, Eric. Mm -hmm. And uh, do, you, do you want me to go ahead with the Chamberlain case? Just a summary of Sure, what... sure. I mean, this, this is a case from uh, uh, November 2011. And it's the, the case of uh, Kenneth Chamberlain, who's both a, a, an ex-Marine and an ex-corrections officer. And uh, uh, in his apartment, in his housing unit, he was 68 years old, both with a heart, chronic heart problem and both with mental issues. He had some, he, he was taking a drug for uh, mental balance, I guess. Mm -hmm. So what happened is that his uh, life alert device, which he used to monitor his heart condition went off. And that device sends an alert to an agent, to the company that makes it. And then they contact local, uh, uh, the local safety. And that's exactly what happened. It accidentally triggered and they, the alert went out, the police and the ambulance and the firefighters arrived. Police knocked on the door. Kenneth said, uh, I'm fine. It went off by itself. I'm sorry, it, it, we, I don't need any help. The police said, open the door. And he kept insisting that he didn't need help. He's just fine. Just go away and leave him alone. The police eventually broke down the door after, uh, uh, I want to say bargaining with him, but the audio device in the life alert recorded racial slurs and whatnot being hurled at him as they, quote, negotiated with him. Uh, so they, eventually they broke down the door, tased him, shot him with a beanbag gun. One officer finally shot, put, sent off two shots. One went through both lungs and uh, killed him. That was the police response to what started out to be a medical alert, and and uh, uh, not going through the entire uh, legal and and uh, process right now. But as of right now, it's still in the appeals court in New York. Uh, some issues in that case are still open, and uh, you know, so it's not totally resolved here in twenty uh, twenty one. Uh, ten years later, uh, almost ten years later after the incident. So the similarities are people in stress or under stress, either from cops ordering you out or cops breaking down your door. Uh, I, I believe in Chamberlain's case, he told them go away. And then he actually talked to the life alert people and said, I think the cops are gonna come in here and kill me. Uh, and because of his mental illness, he basically armed himself with a knife trying to ward off the police who came in and shot him and killed him, just like he predicted. <laughs> and and, and one, of, one of his last words, and because the device was recording, we know this, one of his last words was, uh, Mr. President, I can't hold them off or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. So he was had a flashback or something. Yeah. This was not the right response for a medical, for a mental uh, health issue. Uh, uh, issue. Uh, totally uh, bungled. But uh, didn't mean to interrupt Eric, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, hardly no. the correct that, response. That puts it in context even be even better. Warren, in your you, you, tell us a little bit about the the DJ case, which you're, you're even more conversant with, I'm sure, uh, and why it was one kind of shocking that the grand jury. To me, it was. I know we talked about it on Media Watch ten years ago. How come nothing was brought in indictment wise against any of the police officers for any any way, shape, or form? Give us give us, give us some. Well, it's the you know the grand jury proceedings are you know confidential, so you don't know exactly what testimony was revealed during the grand jury. Um, 
the the presentation is um, by a preponderance of uh, the evidence that there's probable cause um, that there has been some violation of the law as charged. And um, there was no determination of a true bill. And so as a result, there was no further legal action um, 10 years ago. What's surprising is that after um, the family um, who had aggressively marshaled support for further action with the Department of Justice, which resulted in no further action by the Department of Justice, the surprising part is now the district attorney for Westchester County, um, after the persistent efforts of the Henry family and their supporters, amongst whom purportedly were Jay-Z, Kerry Washington, um, and Rihanna, who apparently signed off on a letter re requesting uh, some further action by the, by the district attorney. Um, the result, at least what's been announced uh, to the media, is that a investigation committee to be headed by a former Eastern District federal judge and also consisting of volunteer pro bono attorneys would look into everything, meaning the incident itself, the handling of the grand jury proceedings, uh, the determination not to vote out a true bill, and what result will come out of that investigation, I would say is anybody's educated guess at this point in time. Uh, among the possibilities is, uh, a second grand jury being impaneled and hearing evidence again, and who knows what might happen. Um, in this is, is, is not a preliminary hearing situation where uh, a determination is made by a single judge. So in, in this particular circumstance, all the evidence went before uh, a grand jury. Among uh, some of the interesting facts, uh, you know, apart from the fact that um, there's a dispute about how Hess got in front of the car um, and drew his weapon, um, there's also the reason why the car uh, ended up crashing into another police vehicle after DJ had been shot. There were four shots fired, two hit a steering wheel, one went through DJ Henry's heart, uh, one grazed uh, another student, one of his good friends from Massachusetts, Brandon Cox, and another went into the back seat of the car um, and nearly missed uh, another occupant, Desmond Hines. Well, one of the other uh, interesting facts is that there was another police officer who reported on the scene named Ronald, uh, I believe it's Benchley, and he fired a bullet. And he fired at Aaron Hess, who had shot G.J. Henry, thinking that Aaron Hess was the aggressor and didn't belong in that hood and was the source of an aggressive attack, which turned out uh, from the police side to have been a mistake. So there was a, 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 a lot of confusion. But what, when you think of your college experience and a group of four students celebrating after homecoming, all of whom were football players, slowly moving down a fire lane at police direction and suddenly seeing a police officer in front of a car with a weapon drawn who fires upon them and who offers as an excuse that the, that the car was coming at him as an attack when it was not moving very quickly. Uh-huh. So you've read Cox's statement, haven't you, Warren? About yes, uh, uh, about why they started to um, yeah, and how and how Hess appeared. Yes, uh, from between two two police cars. police cars, right? As the as the car was gradually making its way uh, around the bend at uh, what some had described as an appropriate speed, and and then there's the aggravating circumstances 
that after being shot, DJ Henry was placed on the ground, handcuffed, with no medical attention for at least 10 minutes. While Cox's knee was being tended to immediately by paramedics. Yeah, so you know what? The interesting thing about the last portion of the info that you gave Warren about one cop thinking the other cop was an aggressor, that would tend to give credence to why the Henry family filed their civil lawsuit. It was $6 million, by the way, that they and received. I, I was going to get to that and got a substantial payout from the village of Pleasantville or whoever they sued. But the, my rec recollection is that the family always felt unsatisfied that no one was brought to justice for the killing of their son because the fact that one police officer thought that another was aggressively attacking those young men who were not doing anything dangerous and definitely had no weapons would lead me to believe that somebody fell down in their, their presentment of that case. Warren, tell me a little bit about who that DA was at the time that worked so diligently. I shouldn't say that, I'm implying that <laughs> the DA worked diligently to make sure no bills were returned, no indictments came up. Tell me a little bit about that DA. Well, well, DA I, 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 to, to be clear, that's not a a, a, a a DA decision. I mean, it's a grand jury decision, uh, but you know. Yeah, you know that old saying about that, ham sandwiches. A ham, you know, a, a, a prosecutor could indict a ham sandwich yeah, if, if, right. if they really wanted to, depending on how they handled the grand jury proceedings. Mm -hmm. That's the old adage. Right. But to answer your question specifically, it, the uh, DA at the time was DeForey, the present uh, Chief Justice of the Court of Appeals of the State of New York. Um, so I was not. Is she now the Chief Judge in the State of New York? Yes. The Court of Appeals. So yes. what does that say about how independent and how much they're going to re 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 <laughs> reinvestigate that particular case? <laughs> I mean, well, you know, cool, but <laughs> I, it, it's you know, I hear, I, I hear, uh, in, 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 in the tone of the questioning, um, <laughs> some um, apprehension about the ultimate outcome of the investigation. You interpreted that correctly, <laughs> and I, you know, the proofs of the pudding. We'll, we'll see what the actual outcome is. Mm -hmm. um, I was not the attorney that. Uh, represented the, the, the Henry family, and there was an able group of uh, civil rights attorneys, including Michael Sussman, um, that aggressively pursued it, um, the civil proceeding. Uh -huh. You know, unfortunately, uh, they don't present the evidence in a criminal proceeding, and it's the district attorney representing the people of the state of New York. Right. And, and that's the difference in terms of the zeal, the cooperation um, with regard to the DA's office historically and a police department because they work together to arguably prevent crime yeah. and prosecute offenses of crime. Yeah. So that's why a special prosecutor uh, was requested. And um, I can recall, um, a meeting with then Governor Patterson um, at the uh, governor's office um, in New York City to, as part of the effort to try and get a special prosecutor appointed, but it never happened. Uh, yep, I remember that that never happened. And a hmm. lot of people were upset and figured that that was another one of the steps to make sure that those cops didn't have any serious repercussions for their actions and the people were right about that. But lo and behold, uh, here we are 10, 11 years later uh, and it looks like maybe, what do you know about the person who's going to oversee the investigations of, uh, actually the Chamberlain case, when they went to grand jury presentments and stuff like that, 
they came back with no indictment on that case as well. And I'm not sure who was DA, that was a year later, whether Fiore was still in that chair or somebody else was. I'm not 100% certain, but I believe it was the uh, same district attorney. Mm -hmm. What did you say, Bob? I think you muted. Sorry about that. I believe uh, it was the same DA. In fact, I looked it up uh, and it was the same DeFiore, Fiore uh, uh -huh. the, and, and uh, the Westchester DA at, at the moment, who, like Warren said, is currently the chief justice mm -hmm. in the New York uh, uh, State Court of Appeals. And for those out of staters who don't understand it, that's the high court in New York. Yeah. Um, so, Chamberlain's case got no indictment uh, of the cops and there was some egregious stuff in Chamberlain. I mean, they had the tape recorder of one of the cops uh, using the N word and other whatever racist, racist comments. Um, they had the documentation that Chamberlain basically said, I, I'm under attack by these cops. I, I don't need them. I want them to go away. Uh, and, and I mean, the preponderance of evidence was they took actions that really wasn't logical, sensible, that ended up in the death of this former Marine, former corrections officer, man who served his country well and given service to his community after serving in the military. And because he was not quite all there mentally, but he was taking his medication for that stuff, I'm sure they did a toxicology and they claim, yes, there were drugs in the system. And the people came back with, yes, there were drugs for the medication that he was taking for his mental health condition. No other drugs of any other for whatever. And, and they still didn't come in with a, 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 an indictment of the cops. And, and the, the civil suit, Bob, brief us quickly. They were basically on the losing end of most of that suit until recently when the new movement because of George Floyd got that thing thrown back into the appellate court, right? Uh, exactly, Eric. The, the latest item I've seen, and that's, this is dating back to June 2020, uh, right in the midst of the George Floyd uh, protests, is that a, uh, I believe it's a, it was a two-judge uh, uh, appeals uh, uh, court. And uh, they, they, they restored some of the issues that the original case had thrown out and specifically, they said, and uh, I semi quote, is that uh, an experienced officer would not have believed that entry was necessary, and that was a key phrase in the uh, in the appeals in this mid in this appeals process that brought back some of the charges uh, relating to the entry, the use of force, mm -hmm. but not the fatal shooting. So they don't have all of the charges back, but this is still uh, in the in the frying pan, and it's still it's still uh, it, it's st you know how of course now during the pandemic the wheels of the of the court system have slowed down greatly, but it's still very much a case in flux. So so Warren, that brings us to the new steps being taken and the new investigation. But there's one particular guy who's overseeing that. What's his claim to fame? Do we know something about him? Uh, not much besides the fact that um, he was a sitting um, federal district court judge for the Eastern District of New York. Um, he's, I believe, presently a, a partner in one of the larger law firms in, in, in New York. And um, as a federal judge, um, he was uh, observing, you would think, um, the standards and strictures applicable under the code of judicial conduct for federal judges, which would have made him uh, an impartial decision maker without any um, advocacy of political positions with regard to types of cases or cases actually before him for decision making. Now he no longer holds that position, but um, I'm not uh, familiar with his decision making in the criminal law area. Um, but I would imagine that there's going to be a great deal 
of public scrutiny uh, because of the pu publicity attendant um, to this case and the length of time that that publicity has lasted uh, for more than a decade. And particularly because of the changing political environment with regard to handling of excessive force by individual police officers in particular circumstances. The, the, the interesting thing about that is I was looking up the handling of cases and the actions of police officers and, uh, and why most police officers don't get charged and they fall back on the fact that they were following the policies of the department. And I came across an interesting article that struck my eye, which says that most of these policies and procedures aren't really put together by local police departments. Uh, and it turns out that there's a company, I, let me just quote a quick, how much time do we have guys? <laughs> uh, we have about a minute and a half. Oh, I can't quote much <laughs> from the article. The bottom line is these policies and practices come from off the shelf cookie cutter template, quick headline, and I'll see what I can do. This was USA Today, the reporter was Tammy Abdola. North Carolina Sheriff's deputy who fatally shot Andrew Brown, that's the shooting on, in April, could have avoided taking his life, police experts said, if they had followed best practices, best practices and not opened fire when he fled to a car as they tried to serve warrants. Sheriff's office obtained its use of force policy from a company that sells ready to use manuals that prioritize law enforcement officers' discretion. The policies that hold them to a minimum standard that's defensible in court rather than best practices in policing. And that's it in a nutshell. Blah, blah. And what we're finding is because of that, more back and brown people are getting shot by cops because that's their standards. Not best practices, but practices that can be defended in court. Comes along. This has been Media Watch. I'm your co-host, Eric Tate. I'm Bob Anthony. Catch up to us on Twitter and YouTube at Media Watch EVT. I'm Raymond Peterson. And Warren Bonilla, attorney at law, friend and guest. Thanks again for doing us yeoman service, Warren. Appreciate it. We'll catch you the next time. And thank you for the invitation. All right.